All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Brennan Center for a Justice event, which is held in partnership with the NYU John Bradamus Center and the New York University's Washington, D.C. campus. As many of you know, the Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute that focuses on democracy reform. And you can follow their work by going online at brennancenter.org, following them on Facebook and Twitter, watching their videos on YouTube, and listening to their podcast on iTunes. I'm Michelle Yehi Lee. Um, I am a national political reporter at the Washington Post, and I cover money and influence in politics, and I follow these experts' work very closely, so I'm glad to be here with them and listen to their super smart thoughts. Um, and just a quick note, as I am here as a, a objective news reporter, I don't take a stance on any of the issues that we'll be talking about today, including the role of undisclosed money in politics, which is also known as dark money. So let's get started. There has always been money involved in the political sp sphere, but the technological impact of the money in 21st century politics cannot be understated. There are unknown sources spreading money without their identities disclosed, who are producing online political ads that are being spread in strategic ways, and they have changed the game in significant ways. Joining me to help unpack all of this today is a panel of experts. To my right is Anna Masolia. She's a researcher at the Center for Responsive Politics, where she works with open secrets data on politically active nonprofits, non-disclosing groups, and foreign influence. Anna is also a volunteer web monitoring analyst with the Sunlight Foundation's Web Integrity Project that tracks and analyzes changes made to federal government websites. Uh, to her right is Ian Vandewalker from the Brennan Center. He is the senior counsel at the center where he studies election law and advocates for reform. To his right is Youngmi Kim. She's a, report, uh, she's a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison's School of Journalism and Mass Communication and a faculty affiliate of the Department of Political Science. Kim's research concerns media and politics and the role of digital media in political communication. And to her right is um, Alicia Bannon, also from the Brennan Center. Uh, she's a deputy director for program management and the leader of the center's fair courts work, where she directs research, advocacy, and litigation to promote a fair and impartial judicial system. Welcome. Um, so we'll get started with a brief presentation from each speaker, and then I'll ask some questions, and then eventually we'll open it up for question and answer from the audience. Um, let's get started with Anna. Um, thank you to the Brennan Center for inviting us to be a part of this event, um, and to all of you for your interest. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Anna Masolia, and I'm a researcher at the Center for Responsive Politics. For those of you who are not familiar, the Center for Responsive Politics is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization that tracks money in politics. We also don't take a stance on um, anything other than promoting transparency of money in politics. Um, and so I'm also here in that capacity. Um, CRT re retrieves, cross references, and deciphers a number of different types of filings, from IRS filings, tax returns, FCC data, FEC data, and Department of Justice filings. Um, dark money from anonymous sources has seeped into all levels of the government, from presidential and congressional elections to judicial appointments. Um, dark money groups often operate as effective um, extensions of different campaigns without disclosing their donors. Um, for this and other reasons, the identity of sponsors behind advertising and other political messaging um, leaves voters without the ability to understand who is behind it in many cases. Um, we have been developing tools and resources to help people more quickly and easily track dark money. Um, especially dark money groups that can spend millions of dollars under the guise of um, educational or social welfare spending. Um, purported social welfare nonprofits whose financial activity spikes in different election years um, and plummets in non-election years, as well as spending targeting different geographical areas where there are more competitive races are key indicators of this type of influence. Um, different innocuous sounding names um, by different nonprofits that may sound like they would be working for the social welfare may have more um, more that meets the eye in terms of the reasoning for their spending. Um, 
The Center for Responsive Politics has maintained a database of politically active nonprofit tax returns for a number of years. And while useful, a number of the IRS filings are limited in terms of the ability to track the money in real time because the filings are not required to be filed until long after the fiscal year is over and in many cases, and most cases, the election. This leaves voters without the adequate information to know who's behind the ads by those nonprofits in real time. Because of this, we've incorporated a number of different types of data to support, to I guess supplement this data and um, expand upon it so that we can better track this in real time. This includes filings with the Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Election Commission, and um, most recently, digital ad spending. Um, the Federal Communications Commission filings chart political ad spending and piece together the puzzle, the puzzles that might not otherwise be reported even in Federal Election Commission spending by groups that otherwise do not actually report independent expenditures or other type of spending, or even in some cases register with the Federal Election Commission. Um, through these FCC political ad filings, we have um, liberated thousands and thousands of filings, which are continually updated daily, and examined these to track the network of dark money. Um, and, have con and are continuing to expand upon that. Um, we've also launched a number of tools recently to better chart foreign influence. Um, earlier this year, we launched the Foreign Lobby Watch tool, which tracks legal spending on foreign influence to influence policy and public opinion in the United States through Foreign Agent Registration Act filings that are filed with the Department of Justice. Unfortunately, those filings um, without the Center for Responsive Politics are only available through PDFs, so we are going through and making them searchable, looking at the actual totals of the millions of dollars that are spent to influence US politics and um, looking at those and, and looking at those and updating those daily as well. Um, unfortunately, this still leaves us without the ability to know how much money from foreign in, from foreign interests is seeping in through dark money that are actually targeting U.S. elections. This is why it's so important for there to be disclosure behind these groups. Um, dark money groups have reported spending more than 70, $750 million in U.S. elections since 2010, the year that Citizens United was decided. Um, and total spending by non-disclosing groups has er is already almost reached $100 million in the 2018 election cycle. Um, just 15 groups responsible, responsible for more than 75% of dark money political spending from 2010 to 2016, according to an issue one analysis of our data. Um, we're also seeing a higher percentage of outside spending by non-disclosing and partially disclosing groups since 2016 and 2014 elections to, um, to over 40%, making up 40% of outside spending this election cycle. This is up from 27% in 2016 and just over 38% year to date in the 2014 elections. Um, much of this increase is accounted for by a rise in spending of partially disclosing groups. These could be formed as entities like super PACs, but that um, are, fun are, fun are financed by other dark money groups or through other methods are, are skirting the laws that would otherwise re require disclosure of their donors. Um, the FEC has made some leeway in terms of trying to make better disclosure of some of the dark money groups that are spending on independent expenditures. Um, the, but that but recent guidance issued by the FEC does not necessarily acquire to other types of spending by dark money groups, and there are a number of different loopholes that still need to be filled. Um, this can include spending like issue ads by dark money groups that wouldn't necessarily have to disclose with the FEC because the ads w do not include words like vote for or vote against. These ads are not necessarily encompassed in the FEC's new guidance. There are also a number of other different loopholes that it's left open for multiple different dark monies to be able to form networks that we track that would effectively let a dark money group just report another dark money group as its donor without ultimately disclosing the source of the funds. Um, these types of issues are why the Center for Responsive Politics believes that transparency is so important and that we're trying to piece together these puzzles um, leading up to the midterm elections. Um, especially because US law prohibits foreign nationals from contributing um, and candidates often knowingly receive money from other special interests that might, that might be impacting these elections, it is increasingly important for the voters to know who is actually behind the messaging they're receiving so that they can better understand this information before they go vote in the elections. But in many cases, that information is simply not available. Um, and that's why we're continuing to track this, track this data.
Hi. Uh, um, so I'm leading uh, project data, uh, digital ad track uh, tracking, uh, on all digital ads like a uh, tracking and analysis. Um, this is uh, interdisciplinary uh, research project. Uh, my team consists of. Uh, communication scholars, political scientists, sociologists, uh, and computer scientists, uh, statisticians, um, and we have been tracking uh, digital political ads uh, since 2016 uh, elections. Um, so today I uh, will talk about what happened in the 2016, and then based uh, to give like, some context uh, about uh, what's um, going on uh, in terms of political advertising and money politics. Uh, and then uh, we'll just talk about uh, what changed uh, since 2016, uh, what did not change like, uh, since 2016. Um, so we have been uh, monitoring uh, digital ads uh, 2018 uh, activities, uh, but the scope is very, uh, it's not compatible to what we did like, in the past. Uh, and then what I'm going to talk about today is just the anecdotal, just to, to set the expectation at the right uh, level. Um, so um, to give it a context, I'll talk about like, what we found, uh, what we did, and what we found in the 2016 elections. Um, so um, we, um, Again, like we uh, tracked the digital ads uh, and then analyzed it in real time uh, back in 2016. Uh, we independently collected ad data, um, you know, nothing to do with the attack platforms uh, by using user-based app. Um, so why we did, uh, uh, why we like, used like, a user-based app, uh, it's because uh, Digital political advertising, uh, digital political ads uh, are designed to appear to targeted individuals only. So you don't necessarily see all these ads if you visit like, a political campaigns, like a publicly available website or publicly available Facebook pages. Um, so the only way uh, we could actually track the digital ads back in 2016 was to uh, get help from volunteers um, volunteered voters. Uh, so, so we developed this ad uh, that worked like an ad blocker, uh, but instead of blocking ads, like we collected the ads and then automatically detected it and then collected the ads and then transferred the ad content uh, as well as meta information associated with the ads uh, to my research server. Um, and this is based on consented uh, participants. Um, and then we followed all this, the data protection uh, and data security protocols. Um, so as a result, uh, between uh, September 28th um, and like, uh, November 8th, 2016, uh, we collected um, uh, 5 million paid uh, ads on Facebook uh, exposed to nearly 10,000 uh, people who represented like, a U.S. voting age population. Um, that paper has been already published, uh, so, but uh, you know, it's, not, it, it, it's not accessible at this point. Uh, it's a behind the paywall. So, uh, so I'm going to just uh, highlight like, some of the findings. Um, well, besides, just to, to give it like, a more you know, context, we also collected like, other paid ads, like promoted tweets uh, and then Google ads. Uh, and the like, and then YouTube ads. So uh, we are still working on that. Like a total data amount was like 87 million ads, like exposed to 17,000 people. Um, so it takes some time to uh, figure out what was really going on. Um, so uh, the paper I mentioned is like a stealth media uh, groups and targets behind divisive issue campaigns. That particular paper just focused on uh, issue campaigns. Um, and uh, some of the fi key findings, uh, like uh, we examined, uh, you know, we focused on like eight domains of issues, uh, including abortion, gun, LGBT, uh, nationalism, immigration, terrorism, racial conflict, um, 
and uh, candidate scandal issues like access to Hollywood uh, and uh, Clinton's email server uh, scandal. Um, and then we found that uh, more than half of the sponsors or groups behind this uh, issue campaigns um, were suspicious groups, uh, meaning that like, uh, we were not able to identify these groups. Uh, these groups are untraceable, uh, and um, they did not leave any public footprints because uh, remember our data collection period that like, hit the so-called like FEC windows. So um, it, groups like who are especially like doing express advocacy uh, campaigns like uh, need to file a report to FEC. So our first data collection matching point is like FEC data. So we compare the FEC data to our data to see whether these the groups uh, did file a report to FEC. We found that only eight out of 228 uh, groups we focused on uh, did file a report to FAC. Uh, well, some of the groups like, did not have any requirement, uh, so therefore we looked at IRS databases um, so if, uh, to see whether these groups are nonprofits. Um, and then uh, if we did not find any information from the IRS database, then we moved to like, other research uh, databases, like a media watchdog databases, uh, fact check organization, just to, to find out like, who these groups are. And then if we still didn't find uh, any information about their groups, then we just set aside these groups as suspicious groups. Um, so uh, in fact, like, we set aside these groups uh, for about a year <laughs> until the House Intelligence Committee Democrat uh, released the data. And then we match it, the like, meta information, and then as data, uh, the group's information uh, provided by like, House Intel um, data uh, with our suspicious group's data. And then um, one out of six of our suspicious groups turned out to be Kremlin-linked uh, Russian groups. Um, since then, we have been monitoring uh, these uh, suspicious groups. So, so uh, you know, more than 80% uh, of the suspicious groups, we still don't know who they are. We have been working really hard to figure out uh, who they are. And then we have some good ideas about how they, their strategies and tactics. Um, uh, these groups like clearly targeted uh, you know, battleground states, uh, including Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Virginia. Uh, and then to give you you know context, um, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania uh, used to be uh, strong, um, you know, Democratic stronghold, but turned to support like a Trump with a razor thin margins. Uh, we're not claiming any causal relationship here, uh, it's just the context and then uh, the coverage of divisive issue campaigns in those states, like Pennsylvania, for example, uh, was like a 10, 10 times larger than like a Trump vote margin. Um, and uh, we also found that uh, white voters uh, got specific types of issue as like you know, immigration or racial conflict. But uh, interestingly, uh, non-white voters received a lot of voter suppression uh, ads, uh, including just the demobilizing the election uh, voting uh, itself, like a boycott the election, for example. And then this type of voter suppression ads specifically targeted uh, non-whites, uh, especially African Americans. Um, another findings we have seen is that some of the suspicious uh, it's safe to say like most of the suspicious are connected to one another. Uh, so, and then some in some cases, the suspicious groups uh, sent out exactly same ads, uh, but of course their sponsor names are all different. Um, but um, with that additional analysis, uh, we we, all, we discovered that like, these groups are all connected to one, one another. It looks like they create an entire ecosystem of different types of groups uh, that include like, advocacy group, advocacy looking groups uh, or 
news organizations uh, or grass organizations or individual activists or bloggers. Um, and then that sounds very familiar, uh, you know, if you have uh, read uh, Miller's indictment uh, or more recent um, FBI uh, criminal complaints. So I'll stop here uh, and then talk about uh, what changed uh, and what did not change uh, uh, later. So my work focuses on the courts and judicial selection. And so you know, we see a lot of money um, pouring into state judicial races, as well as money being spent in connection with um, judicial confirmations. In some ways, the trends are very similar to what we see in you know, other political contexts. But they also, there are unique issues raised by virtue of money being spent in connection with the courts because courts play a unique role in our democracy. And so, um, you know, just to sort of to, to frame this, you know, when we think about the role that judges are supposed to play, judges are supposed to be deciding cases based on their understanding of what the law requires. They're not supposed to favor people because, you know, not supposed to favor particular special interests or donors or, you know, favor one side because they're afraid that, you know, their decision is going to be featured in an attack ad if they, if they um, rule the other way. So that's the context that we bring to, to looking at some of these spending trends and thinking about how you know, they particularly impact the courts as an institution that plays a unique role in our democracy. Um, at the Brennan Center, we've done um, two kinds of tracking that I'm going to speak about today. We um, were looking um, with a, a contract with Kantar Media CMAG, we've been tracking television advertisements that were taken out in connection with Justice Kavanaugh's um, confirmation. And then we have also, um, over a long period of time, been tracking spending in state Supreme Court elections. And in that context, we've looked at candidate fundraising, television advertisements, as well as other sources of independent expenditures to the extent we're able to identify them through campaign finance filings or other sources. Um, and I'll give a you know, real quick overview now, and I'm, I'm happy to, to dive into more details in the, the question and answer period. So with respect to um, the Kavanaugh confirmation process, you know, one thing that was you know, different about um, the Kavanaugh process was its timing, that it was so close to the midterm elections. And so one thing that we saw focusing on the television advertisements was that many of them were effectively doubling as campaign ads. We saw um, overall a little over $10 million was spent on um, television advertisement, at least what we were able to capture through Kantar Media CMAG. About 70% of that came from conservative groups that were um, taking out ads in support of, of Kavanaugh's confirmation. About 40% of all of the ads were taken in um, three battleground states, so West Virginia, Indiana, and North Dakota. Um, the biggest spender by far was a dark money group called the Judicial Crisis Network. They spent close to $4 million in total on television advertisements. You know, we don't know a lot about them. They're, they're a dark money group. Through, through tax returns, we have been able to identify um, a donor that is another opaque group. They are the, a group that has also supported the Federalist Society in the past, which was a group that was closely involved in um, you know, creating, creating the list that, that ultimately um, President Trump chose from. So I think it, 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 it shows the kind of close network of interests that have been involved in um, the judicial confirmation process at the federal level. Another thing that I think is interesting about the Judicial Crisis Network in particular is that they've also been very active in state judicial elections, which I'll get to in a minute. So this isn't something where we see, you know, where, where federal courts and state courts are, are kind of cabined off and, you know, maybe it's just state-based interests that are interested in these races. Actually, we're seeing national groups paying close attention and the same national groups that are paying attention to the federal judiciary also weighing in in these state judicial races around the country. And the Judicial Crisis Network has been one of those major players. Um, looking at um, state courts, 
um, you know, state judicial elections are facts of life in states across the country. Um, looking at the state Supreme Court level, 38 states use elections as part of their system for choosing judges. What we've seen over the past two decades is that these processes, these elections have become increasingly high cost and politicized. So in states across the country, we're seeing millions of dollars coming in largely from interest groups. Historically, we've seen um, business interests largely supporting candidates on the right. On the left, most of the money has come from plaintiff side trial lawyers and to a lesser extent, um, unions. Um, national groups and national interests have, um, as I said, been increasingly weighing in on these judicial elections as well. There's been an asymmetry that has largely taken place on the right. On the left, most of the money has still come from kind of state-based organizations, political party structures, and the like. Um, we are tracking the 2018 um, state Supreme Court elections. We, um, because these are low information races, most of the spending actually usually happens in the last two weeks before election day. So we have some indications of what is happening, but we don't know a ton yet. I think the next two weeks are gonna tell us a lot about exactly how these elections are playing out. We have already seen um, some outside groups and money start pouring in um, to races though in Arkansas, North Carolina, and West Virginia. And earlier this year, Wisconsin also had a big money race. Um, but I'll speak a bit about what we saw in the last election cycle, 2015 to 16. We did a kind of deep dive into who pays for judicial races and the spending that, that took place in those contexts. Um, and you know, as I said at the beginning, many of the trends really mirror what we've been seeing in other political, political contexts. But I think they also raise some unique considerations because they're happening in the context of judicial elections. And they impact courts and judges. So there was a record amount of outside spending in the 2015 to 16 cycle. Um, it was about $27.8 million in total was spent on um, spent by outside groups alone. That was about 40% of all of the spending that took place in, um, in state Supreme Courts around the country. Overwhelmingly, this money was secret money. More, we, we did a deep dive looking at each of the outside groups and trying to kind of unpeel the onion, find out who the, who the interests were behind the money. More than half of the money that was spent in these Supreme Court elections was completely dark. The donors were not disclosed. Less than 20% was what we would consider fully transparent. So the, the difference would be groups where they did disclose their donors, but if you unpeel the onion, you find another group. And so you have to kind of keep unpeeling it to ultimately try to figure out who the interests, um, who the interests actually are. And you know, um, dark money is an issue, you know, obviously in all different kinds of elections. I'll just end by highlighting one of the ways that it poses, I think, particular concerns in the context of the judiciary, which is um, about conflicts of interest. So one thing that we've seen, you know, over many years um, with these judicial races is that oftentimes, you know, maybe not surprisingly, the people that are interested in these races, the people that spend money on these races, are repeat players in these very courts. Sometimes with cases going on at the very time that these elections are taking place. And it is very common for judges to be hearing cases involving major campaign supporters. So one thing that I think is a concern with the rise of dark money, particularly in the judicial context, is that it can obscure potential conflicts of interest that might otherwise necessitate recusal, and I think more generally can kind of cast suspicion about the integrity of the courts and the fairness of um, the proceedings proceedings that, that judges are hearing with the kind of the taint of, of big money, money elections potentially casting a shadow on, on the decisions that courts are making. So I'll, I'll end there. Thanks. Um, okay. So I want to talk uh, briefly about an analysis that <clears throat> the Brennan Center just released yesterday, which there were hard copies of on the way in and probably still will be on the way out. Um, we uh, looked at uh, what we're calling shadow parties, which are um, outside groups, uh, super PACs, and dark money groups that are closely affiliated <clears throat> with one of the um, congressional parties. So the Senate Democrats, Senate Republicans, um, and uh, House Republicans and House Democrats. Um, we've found that um, these groups have sort of over the post Citizens United era since 2010, rapidly increased their fundraising and are now 
in 2018 out fundraising, in some cases, the official party committees. Um, this, uh, so the reason these groups exist is because parties are limited by contribution limits and disclosure rules. They have to say where all the money coming in comes from and they can only raise up to a certain amount. These outside groups are essentially not subject to those rules um, and so raise money in unlimited amounts, including contributions of 20 or $30 million and a significant portion of the money um, comes from undisclosed sources. So just to, um, uh, and so the kind of, one of the theories of the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court was outside spending, it's, a, it's sort of okay for outside spending to be unlimited um, because it's not gonna corrupt any politician because the politician isn't raising the money. Um, and one of the features of the sort of world that that created um, is that the spending is sort of in theory uh, independent according to this like legal formalism, but actually um, these outside groups are choreographing their activity with um, the inside group. So in the case of these shadow parties, uh, they're all run by someone who used to be the top aide to the party leader or used to work for the Hill Committee, the DCCC, or, or whichever um, the relevant one is, the party leaders go and raise money for the outside groups. Um, they appear at fundraisers where checks of multiple tens of millions of dollars are raised. So the, the independence isn't really there. And just to take an example of where we're at um, this time, and there's very colorful charts in the handout if you want to pick one up. Um, the Senate uh, is most pronounced on the Senate side. The DSCC, the Democrats' official arm, um, ra has raised $109 million so far in this cycle, and their affiliated shadow groups, the super PACs and dark money groups, have raised $129 million. So it's now the case that, more, financially speaking, there's more power <laughs> in the outside groups uh, than the inside groups. And similarly, Senate, Senate Republicans, the NRSC, raised $114 million in affiliated outside groups. Um, have raised 116 million. And those outside numbers are actually underestimates because um, for the dark money fundraising, they don't actually have to report that anywhere. They sometimes tell reporters um, uh, what they've raised. Uh, and so we're basing estimates on those kinds of self reports, but they're likely, the actual totals are actually likely much, much higher. And um, for the super PACs, again, for the dark money groups, we don't know where the money comes from at all. Presumably the party leaders raising the money know where it comes from. Um, but for the super PACs, we do, you can see the contributions and 90% of those groups' contributions across all four um, congressional parties come from donations of $100,000 or more. Uh, so it's all big money that the average American can't afford, essentially. Um, and this is kind of the, I, I think, the sort of maturation of the Citizens United era where, as I said, independence was part of the theory of it, but we've now seen that the political power structure has just completely sort of taken over this outside money ecosystem and the biggest spenders. I mean, the Congressional Leadership Fund, which is the sort of Paul Ryan affiliated House GOP super PAC is the biggest spender in this election to the tune of something like $100 million. Um, now, uh, what can be done about it? The, the Brennan Center has uh, proposed solutions that are relevant to these issues as well as the sort of foreign money and dark money that others have talked about. Um, on the shadow parties issue, you know, we think stronger coordination rules that limit the ability of the outside groups to um, choreograph uh, activity with the parties that are supposed to be contribution, contribution limited are crucial, and also um, just improving the ability of the parties to raise their own small donor money with uh, ideas like small donor public financing would be beneficial. Um, looking beyond that to dark money, um, you know, just to be clear, dark money, as Alicia said, has sort of problems in terms of conflicts of interest, uh, in influence peddling that's not known to the voting public, but also in the context of foreign money, you know, when the donors are secret, we don't know how many of the donors are potentially um, foreigners, foreign states, foreign powers that that are um, prohibited from get, from donating in our elections. Um, so there's an act in Congress that has been um, 
around for a long time, the Disclose Act that would essentially eliminate dark money by requiring anybody who spends on politics to report their donors, regardless of their 501c status. Um, and then looking beyond that to the sort of online context, one of the problems, as uh, was mentioned, um, is that the spending rules that we have that were sort of generated in a pre-internet era um, don't apply in a sort of rational way to online spending. And this is one of the sort of loopholes that um, helped the Russian trolls do the things they did in 2016, and it has not largely been closed. So there's a proposal, um, there's a bill in Congress now called the Honest Ads Act, which would, um, a big picture, essentially take the spending and disclosure rules that apply to sort of traditional TV and radio type ads and apply them to online spending and make sure that we at least know, uh, we at least have that level of transparency to know what's being spent and who's, being, who's spending it. Um, obviously, that doesn't completely solve the problem of sort of Russian scoff laws, um, but it does generate more information for both the voting public and law enforcement um, and, and the kinds of clues that the Mueller indictments followed to figure out um, what was going on would definitely uh, be a part of those uh, uh, increased transparency rules. So I'll stop there. So we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Um, I want to start off by asking um, Anna and Alicia about what Alicia had touched on in her presentation regarding uh, the Kavanaugh fight and the midterms. I mean, this has been a big year in money and politics, and I think the Kavanaugh and uh, midterm intertwining was a really big story to follow uh, with a lot of implications. And you spoke about Judicial Crisis Network types of ads that they had been running. Um, and Anna, you did some really great documenting about how the left has embraced dark money uh, to influence uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation fight. Um, you did a lot of digging into demand justice, and I'm hoping you can speak to that. And Alicia, if you can speak to uh, what implications does this have on the judicial independence in the, in the Supreme Court um, when so many of these ads were not just targeted at key uh, senators on the committee to advance the vote, but also senators uh, running for re-election in very vulnerable states like West Virginia, North Dakota, and Indiana, like you mentioned, and how apolitical can the courts truly be when so much of the confirmation of the justice is tied to this midterm campaigning? So do you want to start? Sure. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so one of the groups that you mentioned is uh, Demand Justice, which you may have seen different ads, either through digital means or on television, um, mentioning their name. Um, they're a newer dark money group, um, using the term broadly, um, run by a number of different uh, alumni of different liberal campaigns and administrations. Uh, they're orchestrate. They're formed in a unique structure um, that we hadn't really tracked spending by before. Unlike Judicial Crisis Network, which the Center for Responsive Politics has tracked for a number of years, spending millions of dollars on judicial nominees, um, which is still one of the biggest spenders on the conservative side by far. Um, Demand Justice has only recently started spending um, and spent very heavily on the Kavanaugh nomination. They're structured in a way that they operate effectively without a paper trail. They are, a, are fiscally sponsored by a group called the 1630 Fund, which operates as a 501c4 and also has an affiliated 501c3 arm. Uh, the group fiscally sponsors more than 40 different non-entities that uh, appear as entirely independent initiatives or often are referred to as groups, but do not have individual incorporation records, do not file their own tax returns in most cases, and um, are largely just based out of an address that is shared with 1630 Fund and more than 40 of the other entities. These groups are spending heavily not only on, um, in terms, or, in terms of um, judicial network, in terms of judicial confirmation processes, but also in terms of other political spheres, whether that be elections or other types of issue advocacy. Demand Justice specifically was focused on Kavanaugh's nomination and spent millions of dollars to that effect. We were able to track a lot of their digital ad spending and um, especially through Facebook and saw a lot of that. And they've kind of been the first real 
um, rival in terms of a liberal counterpart to the Digital Crisis Network, which was still the biggest spender in terms of disclosed groups um, um, spending on the Kavanaugh nomination. Unfortunately, because of the level of dark money groups and the millions of dollars that were flowing into that, we really only know what was disclosed. And a lot of that doesn't really show up in any filings that are easily trackable. The information in terms of spending by dark money groups on uh, Supreme Court justice nominations isn't reported to the FEC. Um, it, it shows up in Facebook ad data, but that is only recently really trackable. And um, FCC political ad data is probably the best way to track that. Um, but in this case, it's really hard to see the ultimate source of the group since they're only required to post the name of the initiative rather than the funders behind 1630 Fund, how the structure of their finances work, or any real details about how the groups operate other than that. 1630 Fund has maintained a presence um, going into the midterm elections as well. We've seen a lot of spending in a number of different states by different initiatives. and. Um, kind of just a proliferation of that across the board, um, some of which have been tied to 1630 Fund and others would, are reported on as independent groups despite existing as non-entities that don't have incorporations, tax returns, or many other filings. Um, on the Kavanaugh nomination, we saw a number of smaller groups getting involved through digital ads on Facebook. A lot of um, name, names that wouldn't necessarily be household names, even individuals, groups with um, kind of innocuous sounding Facebook groups names that you wouldn't necessarily associate with more traditional political ads were spending and having a potentially large impact through digital advertising. Um, and we saw a lot of that as well as key players who would have spent in the upcoming midterm elections, spending on Kavanaugh ads in the lead up to that. You have seen a lot of um, the clips of different senators during the hearings kind of getting their sound bite for those different political ads, whether that be used for in campaign ads featuring different Kavanaugh themes or in outside group ads. And we saw those pretty much across the partisan spectrum. Great. Um, so one, um, one quick point about um, demand justice and the rise of spending by um, dark, dark money groups on the left, I do want to underscore that, that we are still seeing an asymmetry in spending. So demand justice, at least based on the, the television tracking that we were able to do, which doesn't include digital ads, um, you know, demand justice um, was still outspent by the judicial crisis network about, um, I think they spent about three times more. Um, and you know, overall, the, the right um, outspent the left. It was about 70% of all of the money was still coming um, on the right. So, you know, and I think, and that's also a trend that we've seen in judicial elections as well. I think we're starting to see um, groups on the left pay more attention to judicial issues, but we're also continuing to see, I think, an asymmetry of interest. In terms of what it, it all means for judicial independence, you know, a, lo a lot of the work that I've done has focused on state court issues. And I think there we've seen, you know, overwhelmingly real concerns about how the role of money in judicial elections is impacting judicial independence. You know, we've done polling where close to 90% of all voters think that campaign cash is impacting how judges are ruling in decisions. There's a whole body of political science research that has suggested that in fact um, judges do favor their um, political donors and other interests who are um, you know, supporting their campaigns. Now I, I think the federal judiciary in the context of um, the appointment process is, is likely different. I mean structurally you know, federal judges have life tenure unlike any elected judges in the United States. Um, you know, I think they are, are more insulated from political pressure once they reach the bench. That's kind of how the, the judicial system is, is designed. Uh, frankly, what, what I worry about most is kind of public confidence in the system and kind of public views about the legitimacy of the courts going forward and how the role of all of this money kind of percolating and the kind of broader sense that judicial selection is being just highly politicized, hyper-politicized, that that may do great damage to just belief in the integrity of, of our federal judiciary. And, you know, obviously I think for any of our institutions, right, we care about, you know, we want people to be confident in our institutions. For the courts, I think that's even 
more important because they're, that's their currency. You know, courts, they don't have armies, they don't have power of the purse. What they have is their legitimacy and a, a belief by the public that, you know, we have to, even if we don't agree with decisions that courts are making, we have to respect them. And I think if this process becomes overly politicized, there's a real risk that that trust could be undermined. Thank you. Um, I want to move to Young Me and Ian and talk about online political advertising and regulations. Um, Young Me, you gave us some really eye popping statistics about what you observed from the 2016 election and the types of advertising that you had been monitoring, you and your team had been tracking. Um, and this clearly is still a concern for 2018 and beyond, um, how much our elections are protected from foreign influence and how much is actually coming in. Um, can you tell us about the progress that's been made since 2016, what's changed and what hasn't? And Ian, can you address um, the regulations and laws in existence right now that are most susceptible to bad actors who are looking to uh, interfere in our elections? Um, <clears throat> so there are some uh, self-regulated uh, digital platform level uh, transparency measures that could develop um, since um, we found this supporting interference in elections. Um, so uh, Facebook, for example, um, they uh, verify um, all political advertisers uh, Existence in the United States, um, so they, uh, the political advertisers need to verify their identity uh, and also, um, you know, verify the U.S. address, uh, things like that. Um, and, uh, and then I think you know, Google and Twitter uh, follow the same processes. Um, another thing, uh, the Facebook announced that they was gonna do uh, was like a pager. Like, so you know the. Russian uh, Davis Avisha campaigns uh, focus on a lot of uh, issues. Um, so, uh, and uh, some of the groups were really uh, popular pages, like a Black Tivist uh, gathers like hundreds, like a two hundred, hundreds and hundreds, twelve thousand like uh, followers. So, uh, in response to that, um, Facebook announced that they will verify like a uh, larger. Uh, large, like a popular, like a pagers. Uh, however, what we found is that, for example, suspicious groups are not popular uh, in any sense. Uh, but uh, they are targeting people effectively, and then they are coordinating uh, their campaigns with one another. So it is like a, a, a large network of like a small pagers. So if we just focus on uh, popular pagers, like uh, we are not uh, uh, effectively responding to uh, malicious actors. So that is uh, some limitation. Um, another um, transparency measures is tech platforms, large tech platforms like uh, Google, Twitter, or Facebook are doing is ad archives. Uh, so now uh, we are able to see uh, some ads like almost in real time. So this is really important, like a first step uh, for transparency. Uh, so the academic researchers or journalists uh, or um, investigators could uh, track ads. Um, so uh, so uh, Twitter, uh, the. The Facebook and then Twitter includes like a both candidate and like an issue ads, but Google only uh, Google only focuses on uh, federal election uh, candidates and federal official public officials. Um, but again, our research uh, shows that, for example, taking like a Russian ads and as an example, we looked at all the House Intel uh, Russian ads, um, and then we found that. Although like a 30% uh, of the Russian ads are uh, actually talking about some elections, like we did some dictionary match, uh, so the, you know the, all those 30% of the Russian ads included some terms like a party or a candidate or elections or voting, things like that. Uh, the actual ads that are actually mentioning candidate names are less than 6%. So uh, if we're just looking at federal. Uh, 
election candidates and federal uh, public officials, uh, we are missing a lot. Um, one good thing about like a Facebook uh, issue ad archives, uh, which is like a big, uh, you know, it, it's a, I think it's a big improvement that uh, it gives some uh, paid for by information. So that is like a disclaimer. It just disclaimer rules like a still, I mean, I think we, Ian might uh, talk about that later, but it's just still like a, an inconsistent and unclear. Uh, so I have a lot of complaints about that, but um, so, but like a Facebook uh, and then both like a promoted tweets and then Facebook or political ads, at least like a show is like a, uh, not just a sponsored indicator, but also paid for by information. So we have been tracking uh, our non-FAC groups um, and then uh, we found that uh, one of the big fan club um, or hobby groups, uh, we classified as AstroTurf, like a uh, movement unregistered group in our original study, turned out to be paid for by a shady unknown media company. So now we know that like, uh, these fan clubs or communities or grassroots organizations might not be real grassroots organizations and then the ads they are putting out are in fact like, sponsored by uh, still unknown <laughs> uh, shadowy LLC groups uh, that's supposed to do like, some media work. Um, so we still don't know like, uh, who are actually behind this media company, but uh, uh, the voters are uh, getting one step closer to uh, understanding who are actually behind the ads they are um, seeing. Um, so those are a like, big improvement. Um, still, what has not changed uh, the coordination. Uh, so, um, so coordination still happens. Um, and um, it is just like, a, you know, I talk to Facebook, hey, like if, if there's somehow we can like easily track the network of these super PACs or nonprofits uh, or groups or, you know, um, and then what they are doing uh, um, through like at this political ad archives would be great. Um, you know, that has not still happened. So, Coordination, uh, some of the patterns we uh, spotted are like, um, it's just actually similar to like a how dark money groups like a work. So, um, so it's exactly the same as or similar as are run uh, sponsored by like a multiple different groups. So it's, uh, at the surface level, if you just look at the face of an ad, uh, it just to look like uh, that is like a voter's perspective, right? Like it's just a fast face of as then it just to look like the well, the same messages are uh, same messages echoed by like a multiple groups. So it creates like a kind of a perception that oh, this is really important issue, and then this is uh, supported by uh, multiple uh, groups, and then these groups are all uh, linked to the same landing pages, and then this is. Uh, New. So if you like, visualize like a Facebook ads or Facebook ads archives more precisely, uh, so sponsored and paid for by information and landing page uh, uh, destination uh, pages uh, must be consistent. So four, inf four pieces of information must be consistent uh, ideally. Uh, but what we found is that uh, Different group names, different paid for by information, different sponsors, but they share the same landing pages. And if you go to the same landing pages, then, well, this group, whatever it is, sometimes it's nonprofit uh, or grassroots organizations or community uh, popping out uh, a bunch of shell groups. Uh, and then each of these shell groups are doing their posting their ads, uh, of course, uh, in addition to like an organic post. Um, so this coordination, coordination, I think, you know, coordination still exists and it's getting a lot more sophisticated. Um, uh, we are glad that like, we have enough, like, a, you know, uh, we learned, like, a, uh, picked up like, enough, like, a 
tips and uh, skills to spot uh, these coordinations. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's something that uh, I'm concerned about. Yeah, I, I think the platforms are really struggling with this, um, or the big platforms are anyway, um, in a sort of very public way. Um, <clears throat> you know, transparency in response to the foreign online interference seems to be, seems to me to be a sort of basic minimal <laughs> step. Like we should at least take away places to hide. Right, right now, it's so easy to put political messages online and not reveal anything about yourself. Of course, Russian trolls or Iranian state media or whoever else that we don't know about, they're gonna walk through that door. Um, so, you know, I think transparency at a minimum and there's, so there's voluntary efforts with Facebook, Google, and Twitter to do that and they're, they sort of have their strengths and weaknesses. I mean, one of the things is, Facebook, you know, the, the paid for buy, um, you can put whatever you want and paid for buy, right? I can buy a Facebook ad and under the paid for buy say, uh, you know, Senator so-and-so is a jerk and that's my paid for buy. Um, so obviously that's inadequate from the perspective of why we have disclosure, which is to educate voter at the moment. Um, well, disclaimers, educate the voter at the moment uh, that they see the ad. Um, so Congress has done nothing from this perspective uh, since the 2016 revelations. The FEC has struggled to improve uh, transparency uh, for online ads. Um, there are some state uh, efforts. New York and California have both, both uh, passed new sort of transparency regimes for um, online ads. And that's, you know, in other states, that's sort of new. and. Um, We'll see how that works out, but um, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. Thank you. Um, next question is for Anna and Ian. Ian, you spoke about the shadow groups, and um, I want to talk about another uh, super PAC trend that we've been seeing really in the past year or so uh, take root. Um, is Super PACs delaying revealing their donors until after the election has taken place. So these are groups that are being kind of pop-up groups right before a special election or a primary election, just close enough to the FEC deadline that they don't have to reveal anything about themselves or the donors. And then after the ballots are cast and the results are announced, then we find out who had been behind the actual super PAC. Um, and we saw this, uh, especially in the Alabama Senate special election last year with Highway 31. Um, it was supporting, uh, spending millions of dollars to support Doug Jones, and we didn't quite know, know who they were. And then after the election, we found out that a uh, Senate majority PAC aligned with uh, you know, Chuck Schumer and Senate Democrats had been the biggest donor. And we saw this a lot in the primaries too, with some vague name for the super PAC, so we don't know exactly know what they're about, you know, they're called Red and Gold or Mountain Families Pack. And then after the actual nominee is chosen after the primaries, then you find out who had been funding them. Um, I wonder if you had been seeing any other uh, super PAC trends this year similar to this or even not exactly related, but also new. Um, and with tactics like this, which is legal, I wonder, doesn't it go against the spirit of disclosure and letting the voters know who is funding super PACs where the donors are disclosed? Um, can both of you speak to that? Uh, sure, well, we've certainly seen a number of different super PACs that have started to use this tactic. Once one started, it seemed to have opened the floodgates in terms of different super PACs um, spending, in some cases, millions of dollars on different elections and not disclosing their donors until after the elections. Um, the concept, however, of um, kind of gaming deadlines of filings and kind of gaming fil filing periods generally is not necessarily a new concept, though in application um, to super PACs here, it seems to be the case. We've seen it a number of times with different uh, dark money groups who are able to choose their fiscal year and can 
and are able to game that around their spending. Many times you see their spending almost immediately after the start of their fiscal years to um, postpone the deadline as much as possible. We're seeing that now with super PACs who um, increasingly close to elections, um, start new organizations due to the ease of that and are able to, in some, in some cases, have multi-million dollar donors who are not disclosed until after the election. Um, we've seen a number of different trends in terms of super PACs and other disclosing groups finding ways to skirt the intent of the law, um, both on the donor side as well as on the spending side. Another issue we've seen kind of playing on the digital ads has been um, disclosing groups that will spend in bulk to different digital consulting firms on or for digital services, but not disclosing the nature of those services. And in many cases, that can result in hundreds of Facebook ads or other types of digital ads that are not necessarily disclosed, leading to just kind of a black box of spending in those cases. You don't know what the ultimate goal of that spending is, but you also don't know the location of that spending in many cases unless you're looking at other types of filings. For example, a number of different spenders may spend on digital services for their Senate race, but end up targeting groups in other states in a lot of cases. Um, we've seen kind of a resurgence of this in the lead up with um, presidential hopefuls um, in recent cases. There's a number of different tactics super PACs have used. Um, probably the biggest issue that we've seen or one of the biggest issues has been super PACs that are funded by other dark money groups, um, which while the super PACs are disclosing their donors even before the elections in these cases, you may not know the ultimate source of funds since it's just a group that doesn't disclose its donors. Um, also going to um, what Ian had mentioned about kind of the shadow parties, um, in a number of different cases, kind of at least one emerging trend that I've noticed among the groups that are super PACs that kind of gamed the system for disclosing their donors after the election, a number of those have been tied to different party groups, um, national groups based in DC, even though the super PACs are targeted at different state levels. And um, I'm not sure if that'll end up being a growing trend, but it's certainly something that we're, we're watching. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have much to add. I think that's a, that's this excellent categorization of all the ways that people game the system. I mean, it, there's always a bit of a cat and mouse. You know, there's smart people who have a lot of money and hire very smart lawyers to like get around the system, get around the rules. Um, and it, it just goes to we should update the rules periodically in response to what's actually going on, which doesn't happen. Um, you know, Congress is not the most functional entity in the world right now. And um, stuff, issues around campaign finance and even disclosure, which I said seems like a sort of basic minimal regulation, um, has become highly uh, is a sort of partisan football, unfortunately. My next question is for Alicia. Um, you've spoken about the state court trends and the types of money that's flowing into um, influencing state courts. Um, based on your research, uh, what are the major areas for reform here? And um, are there any states that have taken on reforms this year? And if so, what are they doing? And are there any uh, challenges, political or otherwise, that remain in bringing more light to who's influencing state judicial elections? Well, I, I think maybe the, the, the good news is that I think there's a lot that states can be doing. I think that maybe not so good news is that we, we haven't seen a lot of activity um, to date. The, we actually just put out a report last week looking at um, kind of judicial selection reform and making a series of recommendations about what's, how states should be choosing their state Supreme Court justices. That's where we've seen most of the money you know, pouring into, into these elections. And so we are calling for first states to move away from using judicial elections, adopt what we call a publicly accountable appointment system. Now we know from the, the Kavanaugh experience and others, not all appointment systems um, work all that well either, but we looking at different experiences in the states, we do think there are best practices to draw from using 
a bipartisan independent nominating commission with diverse membership to vet potential nominees and create a binding shortlist that a governor then has to choose from. And then on the back end, we also call for states to adopt a lengthy single term for judges. I mentioned that, um, you know, basically, um, Virtually no states have, at this point, life tenure or any kind of single term. Judges are regularly either standing for new elections or in a handful of states facing reappointment decisions. And there's a lot of evidence that that's where the threats to judicial independence are most pronounced, where you're hearing cases and having to worry about your job security at the same time. And so, you know, we think there are some big structural changes that states should be seriously considering. You know, within states that use elections, there's also a lot of reforms that they could adopt to, um, you know, bolster the systems that they currently have. So, for example, um, I mentioned that if you look at who the spenders are, they're overwhelmingly groups and interests that are appearing before state state court judges. Most states have very weak rules regarding when judges are supposed to step up aside from hearing cases in the face of all that spending. And there has been some movement. There was a, there's been a push in Wisconsin um, recently. I think uh, over 50 retired judges came together with a, a letter calling for the state to um, adopt stronger um, recusal rules, um, recusal rules for their judges. Um, you know, the other side of the coin is also stronger disclosure rules. Um, there have been a handful of states that are, you know, already strengthening um, their disclosure rules, and we think that's another area for, um, you know, where where there's both big picture reform you can do as well as kind of judges could change their court rules. So at the very least, if you have somebody who's appearing before you, they should be required to tell, you know, to disclose any spending that they've done in connection with your campaign. Great. So Young, we have a question for you, and then after this, we'll open it up for a Q&A from the audience. Um, you spoke earlier about the self-regulatory steps that the tech companies have been taking, um, but clearly challenges remain. So I want, I'm wondering if you can speak a little more to what else the tech companies could be doing um, to try to bring about more disclosure and educate their users about the types of content that's running on their platforms? Well, I have like a laundry list of the things, but uh, um, one thing I, I emphasize a lot is uh, we need to uh, have some kind of a policies, like a consistent policies ac across platforms. I don't know if that's something tech platforms can do or not. Uh, I could, well, just take an example, like a one thing, one small thing. Is like, okay, so the, we have like an ad archives, so, so we are now able to see um, paid for by information uh, and then actual ad content, like a face of an ad. That's really good. Uh, we still don't know how they coordinated these uh, advertising activities. Um, recently, like a Facebook took down, like a purse, like an 800 accounts um, and pages. Uh, and, you know, um, that moment, uh, you know, it's just like it hit us really hard. Like we lost a lot of suspicious groups. Um, <laughs> it sounds like I, you know, it's like I have some attachment like <laughs> to, to like a suspicious group. But <laughs> um, uh, we, I'm very concerned about that just because you know the Facebook described them as uh, like a clickbait, like a taking advantage of midterm elections to uh, generate some profits. Um, yes, there are definitely an element of a clickbaiting, clickbait type of behavior, uh, but I have like, a strong reason to believe that they are not just a clickbait. Uh, we don't know, um, and actually, you know, we don't know whether this is clickbait or or something else. Uh, knowing about themselves might not be that important, uh, but. The bottom part is that uh, Facebook is the only company that has takedown data, and then uh, we don't know what they are doing with it. And then there is no policies to uh, impose like a, some kind of uh, policies. Like a, so, ad archives, for example, like a Facebook has a clear policy uh, that, uh, that they will keep like a political ads for seven years. Uh, but takedowns, I inquired about that. Um, inconsistent um, 
answers. Uh, it all depends. Uh, you know, some complicated like a privacy uh, regulations. Uh, so if we want to go back to these pages, um, then um, you know we might not be able to find anything, um, even though like we have like some strong empirical evidence that that uh, some clue that could that could like lead us to some big discovery. Um, so archival policies is something that I really wanted to um, emphasize. Um, yeah, I'll just stop now. All right, so let's open it up to the audience. If you have any questions, please line up at one of the microphones. There are two, one on each side. Um, please tell us your name, and please make it a one-part question, not a comment. Question, not a comment. One part. Question. Go ahead. Begin to the microphone. You have to press it on. Sorry. It's for Alicia to follow up on conversations. On the dark money side, I've been looking at judicial ethics codes. Um, how is a judge going to know who the funder of their dark money is or who the supplier of their dark money is in order to know there's a conflict? It, it's a great question, and it, it's something that has come up a lot in the context of calls to strengthen judicial recusal rules because judges are understandably concerned that they, they don't want to be in a position where you know it, it turns out that you know they should have recused themselves, but they really didn't know and they didn't have a way to know. Um, I think that for um, I, I think there's actually a, a pretty straightforward way to address um, at least conflicts of interest. Um, you know, disclosure in the con context of exposing conflicts of interest that could be impacting um, litigation, which is that states should consider and judges could consider they could do this by court rule requiring um, litigants to disclose any spending that they have done, including supporting independent expenditures in connection with um, a judge's election. In the same way that in federal courts, um, litigants are required to, to provide corporate disclosure statements, and that allows judges to do an appropriate recusal analysis. Similarly, you could adopt a measure like that. You know, it, it won't get everything, but it will at least address that specific issue of making sure that judges have the information that they need to make the recusal decisions. Any other questions? Come on, we have great minds here. I know you have questions. There you go. Hi there. Um, so I want to off here. Um, I wanted to go back to the conversation we were having earlier about the about Facebook's political ad archive. Um, so it's there and that's good, but what does Facebook define as a political ad and what should Facebook define as a political ad? Is it anything that mentions a candidate, anything that mentions an issue, um, ads that are coming from groups that are defined as political, um, and what do you think would be the most transparent way for Facebook to define ads that are political? Um, it's a good question, uh, and if you have an answer, I'm sure Facebook would like to hear it. Um, so Facebook uh, has a broad definition. They include um, all candidates, uh, all federal candidates, which is a pretty easy list to get, and all state candidates, which is a little bit of a harder list to get. Um, and they also include political issues. Um, and for that, at least initially, they have not been especially transparent about it, but at least initially they had a list of 20 issues um, that included abortion, immigration, gun control, sort of not surprising issues, although I think the last one on the list was values. <clears throat> So unclear what that means. But they've also reserved the right to change that um, over time without telling anybody. So uh, it's not clear that they're still using that list of 20 um, issues. Uh, you know, 
it's hard. It's a hard definitional question. What is a political, you know, the NFL is a business entity, but then the take a knee protests happen and the NFL becomes a political issue. Um, so it changes over time. Um, there's at least some subjectivity to it. You know, uh, I don't, I don't think, I think if anybody tells you they have the, the world's final definition on what's a political ad, they're wrong. Um, I think it's more important that if the platforms are doing this voluntarily, that they be transparent about it, that everybody who's using the platform know that scholars who are studying what's happening on the platform know what the test is that they're operating under. Um, and so that's what's missing right now. Yeah, George Ripley. Uh, I'm curious as to whether any of you are interfacing successfully with the Department of Homeland Security on any of this. Um, I doubt it. <laughs> uh, the, so the Brennan Center works with DHS on the sort of election security side of the foreign interference. Um, that is kind of the hacking and our voting machines safe. On the information operations side, um, the federal authorities are much less open about what they're doing. It has recently, just today, I think, been reported that um, federal authorities have communicated with known Russian trolls simply saying, we know who you are, um, not disrupting their activities, but sort of hoping just having someone know that their identity has been unmasked by um, US authorities might deter them. Um, but to my knowledge, you know, whatever's happening uh, at, at the federal level in terms of these sort of fake accounts and the propaganda is um, all behind the scenes. May I ask um, why you asked that question? Just to understand because the context. I, because I am aware that the Department of Homeland Security is digging into that whole issue very, very seriously, and, and that the that elections have become part of the critical infrastructure. Is that the term? Uh, and so that it's under their their uh, purview. So you know. <clears throat> So cybersecurity issue is really important, like election security. So there are three different types of things we can think about. So like one is the act, you know, attacking on an infrastructure. Like that's like a, you know, the nano definition of a cybersecurity. That's definitely uh, Homeland Security Department uh, is interested in. Uh, another thing is like a, you know hack and lick. So DNC leak, you know, that is sort of a new phenomena. Uh, usually, uh, the infra, you know, the infrastructures like got hacked, and then you know our nation like focused a lot on this, like you know protecting this infrastructure. But hack and leak, a hack like a, a political party and the leak, you know, e the entire emails is it's just like a, a very new uh, tactic. Um, um, I think like, a homeless. Security can do something about that. Um, not sure. Um, the third type is like information uh, warfare or information influence campaigns in the social media. Um, it is really uh, complicated issue. Uh, we think that because foreign, because of a foreign interference in elections, um, intelligence communities, uh, you know, have to take this issue seriously, but at the same time, uh, what we have been seeing and more and more is that uh, these 14 actors are interlocked uh, with uh, domestic actors. Um, so A, it is really hard to figure out uh, who are 14 and who are domestic. Uh, B, um, it's almost uh, you, we really need to think about like a, you know larger issues. Why these uh, actors like interlocked on social media? So that's why I think it is really important to think about a campaign finance, a foreign interference issue, uh, in a broader context like a campaign finance issues. Um, and I'll just, just stop here. 
When you say interlocked, do you mean there are domestic actors who are enabling the activities abroad? So we don't know. So we know that uh, domestic actors. Uh, so you know, I mentioned that there is some we spotted some networks of coordination, uh, and this is usually it's it's there is a pattern. So uh, so for example. It's not just about all like grassroots organizations or all advocacy groups. Uh, it includes grassroots organization, PAC, uh, and news organization, uh, individuals, uh, things like that. And then, um, and that kind of picture is like, similar to you know what Russian uh, Russians did. And then that work, if you dip, go deeper, you will find that. This network is also connected to uh, ad farms and internal farms uh, and marketing uh, companies uh, and uh, data vendors. Um, so this uh, poses uh, incredible challenges, not only for researchers to sort out um, what is really like a foreign interference and what's not, uh, but also um, to understand like, how campaigns work. So that I, my feeling is that um, in this the data-driven, algorithm-based, like a digital platform-oriented like a campaigns, uh, we'll see a lot more of these patterns. So all these like, data vendors and poll companies, marketing firms and ad firms and internal firms and advocacy groups and grassroots astro, astroturf types of like, you know, Organizations and the foreign actors like all like work together sometimes knowingly or unknowingly. So this is something like policymakers need to think hard uh, how we're gonna deal with this uh, emerging types of uh, campaign activities online. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, policy proposals for de delineating the difference between uh, free speech covered under the First Amendment, uh, fake news or complete misinformation, and then clickbait? Or are we going to let companies like Facebook sort of decide for us and you know shut down pages without any sort of transparency into what they're defining those to be? Um. Yeah, I, well, right now we're letting Facebook decide that. Um, it is, I think, I don't know the answer. It is, I think, something that we sort of, as a society, need to struggle with. We've, we've sort of come into this new age. You know, there was a time in American politics when, like, the railroad companies sort of owned everything and made all these grand social decisions um, free of government regulation, and I think we're now in a time where the internet companies are sort of filling that role and making these big social decisions about um, uh, how our society works without any government regulation. Um, and that is scary. Uh, the conversation is happening. There's people in Washington who are trying to deal with it. The sort of shocks of like the Russian interference uh, help that conversation happen. but. It's very early stages, um, and there are huge looming questions, you know, beyond foreign interference, like in terms of data privacy, and do we really want these private companies owning 5,000 points of data on us and selling it to politicians who are trying to manipulate our votes, um, as well as like free speech issues and 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 how all this fares in democracy and is clickbait bad for democracy? And I'm. I could list questions all day and not offer you any answers, um, but uh, I definitely think that you know we need to be demanding answers from our elected officials. Great. Any last question before we wrap up? All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you so much for standing up for the last question. Hi. Um, 
Good, uh, my name is George Farrell, and I'm, I actually run a PAC called Black PAC, B L A K P A C dot G O P. And I think there's an overemphasis on Facebook because we really use Facebook to communicate with our grassroots or our people uh, who are true grassroots and true leaders. Our PAC actually helps elect minorities across the country as Asians, Latins, and blacks. And, and um, I think the, the emphasis on dark money, I hate that term, <laughs> dark money, in Facebook is overemphasized because I think they're kind of passe. So if you're looking to regulate something in the past and you hop on that, by the time the regulation's written, it's done. We are actually much more successful with Twitter. Uh, we helped get Karen Handel elected in Georgia using Twitter. We had a, a million Twitter hits uh, with using these Twitter rooms. Uh, and we were identified later on, two months later, as a Russian bot. <laughs> and our Twitter rooms were shut down. I think 70% of our Twitter rooms were shut down. Um, so there's a real impact when you overreach and overregulate because this social media thing is the only way that a lot of lower in income or lower access people will have a, a way to get not uh, acknowledged. So I don't want to overregulate it to the point where uh, people who are just getting started in politics or millennials get shut down. So that's my last point. Thank you for having this. It was wonderful. Thank you for the comment. Um, well, thank you so much to our panel, um, Anna Masolia, Ian Vandewalker, Yangmi Kim, Alicia Bannon. Um, I'm Michelle Yehi Lee from The Washington Post. And please keep up with the work of the Brennan Center online at brennancenter.org, on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube, and on, with their podcast on iTunes. And thank you to our audience here at NYU Law School and to everyone who's listening online.